Germs, anyone would like to share? Yes, members. Uh, my cousin Enrique in Minnesota went through, uh, still has cancer and he's not doing well. So please pray for him. And my writing partner decided to try to do too many things on the bike. He fell sideways, broke his finger, and they think that he might have some problems with the hip. So pray for him to at least get an MRI on Wednesday. Hopefully everything will be okay. Yes, ma'am. I've added, um, added two people to our prayer list. Um, they're uh, mothers of real close friends of ours who are both in hospice care and both nearing um, end of life, I think. Um, and one is Grace Chevalier, and the other one is um, Nettie Lou Simonson, and Nettie Lou is the mother of some of our people who come always on Christmas Eve. They only come once a year, but they come here on Christmas Eve, so I kind of like their member here. So. Anyway, that's uh, Gina's mom. Thank you. There was a hint, yes, Karen. I wondered if you would indulge me in a joy that I have. Uh, many of you have asked about my son, Shannon, who has been diagnosed with cancer, uh, just, well, he kind of, I would say, withdrew. He just kind of buried himself at home, and he only wants to talk to his wife, and uh, part of it is because he has a feeding tube as well as a fork. He's in aggressive treatment with uh, chemotherapy once a week and radiation five days a week at the same time. Um, but just last Friday night, he's a respiratory therapist at Decatur Memorial Hospital. And just last Friday night, several of the people from Decatur Memorial Hospital surprised him with a visit. Uh, they brought along a care package and over $3,000 as a collection to help him. And he wrote a, a message to Decatur Memorial Hospital I'd like to share with you. I worked in healthcare as a respiratory therapist for 32 years. 17 of those years have been at Decatur Memorial Hospital. I recently found myself on the other end of the stethoscope with the unfortunate diagnosis of stage four posterior, I think it's pharyngeal cancer. I was expecting the heartfelt love and support from family and friends. What I wasn't expecting was the overwhelming amount of love and compassion that has come from the staff of DMH, Decatur Memorial Hospital. Unbelievable. Administering quality care with kindness becomes rote when you're at the bedside of your patients. When you excel at this profession, these traits extend beyond the hospital and spill over into your community and your everyday life. I believe this trait has the power to not only heal, but to inspire others to act likewise. I've personally been blessed with the outpouring of thoughts, well wishes, prayers, compassion, from my second family at DMH. Your support has inspired me as much as it has humbled me. For me, 17 years at DMH doesn't seem possible, but it's a fast-paced world in which we live. This experience has taught me to slow myself down. I find myself taking a moment to identify and recognize the beauty in what I normally would have thought to be mundane. Learn this. Saving time is never as important as cherishing it. Some might say, those beautiful rose bushes have nasty thorns. I prefer to say, those nasty thorn bushes have beautiful roses, end with the good. I feel as if I do owe a debt to all of you. So like it or not, I plan to beat this and come back to work with you. Who knows, maybe 17 more years. I still have mountains to climb, figuratively and literally. Thank you, thank you. To be continued. 
tonight. Thank you for sharing with us. I was just going to say thank you to everybody who helped on Thursday with our fun day of labor. It was fun. Um, I, I'm, I will just say that I'm, I'm not, um, I'm very biased uh, to say this, but Barbara and I went <laughs> to see Alex um, at, at Wofford last night in Equus. It's a very, very intense show where he's playing the lead, and it was unbelievable. I, I just had no idea that this young man had, had this in him. It was absolutely incredible. I don't know any professional actor who could have done better. It was really phenomenal. So um, if you have a chance, they are doing it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night at Wofford uh, in the Fine Arts Department, uh, 8 o'clock. So anybody wants to go, do come up to me if you plan to go, just so I can warn you. <laughs> Uh, it's a very, very intense show, um, but absolutely phenomenal. Let's begin our worship with the prayer meeting. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. We hear the voice of Jesus. We lift our voices to God. And we call on the name of the Lord. The risen Christ is here in this place. Hallelujah.
teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As his disciples in this age, may the scales fall from our eyes and the newness of our relationship with him guide us along our journeys. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may recognize Jesus' presence and with all disciples of every age cry, the Lord has risen indeed. <coughs> Through Christ who lives and reigns with you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, as we come to this place and we enter into this divine worship, we discover something about ourselves that perhaps we've always known but comes into sharper focus. That we are a sinful creature. That each of us has fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, even after falling short, we don't get demerits, we don't get marks against us. We get God coming after us, pursuing us with immense grace. I invite you into the prayer of confession to open up those broken parts of ourselves that we may be renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Christ, our companion, we confess we fail to see you walking beside us in our work in our homes, in our communities. We are easily discouraged when it seems all is lost, isolating ourselves instead of trusting that faith is a journey, not a destination. Forgive us and help us to see the resurrection as a reality, not a false Keep us mindful of your guidance and your promises as we travel through our days. Amen. On the, road, on the road to Emmaus and set their hearts ablaze. By the power of your spirit, kindle our hearts as we hear your word proclaimed that we may receive you with joy. Amen.
lift up the cup of salvation. I will call on the Lord's name. I will keep the promises I made to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. The death of the Lord's faithful is a costly loss in his eyes. Oh yes, Lord, I am definitely with your servant. I am your servant and the son of your female servant. You freed me from my chains. So I will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to you, and I will call on the Lord's name. Of many spiritual practices, St. Ignatius of Loyola taught that the use of imagination can lead us into a much richer understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. He called this practice of reading and prayer sacred imagination. It means to place ourselves fully within a story from the Gospels, becoming onlookers or participants using each of our senses and giving full reign to our imaginations. Jesus is speaking to a blind man at the side of the road. We feel the hot Mediterranean sun beating down, smell the dust kicked up by passers-by, feel the itchy clothing that we're wearing, the sweat dropping down our backs, the rumble of hunger, and we notice Jesus, his expression, his words, his gestures, the irritation of the tired disciples, our own relief at seeing for the very first time when he heals our eyes. And then we can imagine other words he might have spoken, other deeds he might have done, or how our lives have been changed forever after encountering that man. So, with that introduction, I invite you into today's gospel story. Close your eyes if that feels right for you. Together, let's take two deep breaths in and out. Use all your senses to engage the story. Imagine yourself a participant or an onlooker. Then allow yourself to feel the things that you would feel. Smell what you would smell, taste, see, and now, listen. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas. He said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? He said, what has happened? They said, the things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death, and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with a story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women said. But they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see that these things happen, had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer? And not only, 
and only then enter into his glory. Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going on, but they pressed him. Stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening. The day is done. So he went in with them, and here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread. He blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him, and then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their friends gathered together, talking away. It's really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As many of you know, my wife is also a Presbyterian pastor, and we're preaching on the same text this morning, but taking different tacks on it. But I am using her same end, the introduction to what a sermon is about. She claims in her introduction that she absolutely loves me, which I believe. And she wants to tell this story about some of my idiosyncrasies. <laughs> I figure if they're coming onto the internet from where she is, it needs to be on the internet from where I am <laughs> to defend myself. She wants to say that I'm not the neatest man in the world. And probably not the messiest either. And recently, she discovered that my glasses had been MIA, missing in action for a couple of weeks. I have a spare pair, not as good or helpful. And I walked into the kitchen one day and I had them on my face. And she said, where did those come from? And I said, oh, I, um, I just found them. They were under the bed. I mean, just right under the edge of the bed. But I swear I've looked a million times. And she has the resolve to either help me or to let me help myself. And it goes back and forth. Let me help myself, I'll help him out because it can be rather painful to keep answering my phone calls, asking where my glasses or my wallet are. Today, people get new sight, almost as if Jesus provides them with the glasses that they have lost. Today's passage has a few things to say about eyes to see. Just before today's passage in Luke's gospel, there is the account of the resurrection and the empty tomb. Two women show up, and guess what? The stone is rolled away, the body is gone. And they have a man there, a messenger in dazzling clothes who says to these two women, Jesus is not here. He has been raised. Terrified. Or excited, maybe. The women run from the two, and they tell Peter. 
And what you'll discover is that people on the margins become the first ones to share the good news that God has defeated death. I'm talking about women. It's in, the, it's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. I'm not reading into it a meaning that it does not have. Women. Second class citizens at best. Proclaim the good news that God has done something that no one else has done. Raised Jesus from the dead. And so they run to share this terrifying and exciting good news. They tell Peter. And we all know how Peter is. He is the one who says, I'll be right there. I'll get right to it. And when the moment calls for sturdy conviction, Peter flounders. But when he hears this news from these two women, he rushes to the tomb to see what they have seen. And Jesus and Peter also discovers, oh my goodness, it's empty. And I've heard that Jesus Christ has been raised. What has been said by Jesus has come to fulfillment that he will be raised that all of what he does and what he has done is vindicated by a God who says this is my son my beloved with whom I am well pleased as if to say to the authorities the principalities and the powers that be He's unstoppable. I'm affecting change from the margins. But Jesus is risen. And three people at this point have heard the news and gone to see. They wanted evidence with sight. And isn't that wonderful? New eyes, new sight. They've seen it. There's circumstantial evidence. Today's passage, however, unfolds a bit differently, right? Two disciples. Are walking on the road, traveling to a town called Emmaus, just outside of Jerusalem. And they're disappointed. They haven't heard this news, they haven't seen the evidence, and they're grieving together. Maybe Jesus wasn't what he said he was. Maybe we shouldn't have put all our eggs in one basket. And a stranger meets them. Again, place yourself inside of that story. Imagine just walking with a friend. And realizing that the hopes and the aspirations that were part of the dream of what God is up to just came to an end. When they meet this stranger who just pokes out on the road, he says, almost like a leave it to beaver moment. What's up, guys? What you up to? And I 
love the disciples' response. Because here's how I interpret it. Are you an idiot? <laughs> Have you not heard what's been going on? And they tell him the story about his life and what has happened. So good for them. They were paying attention to the realities and also expressing in the middle of that story what their hopes were for Israel, for God's people. And the one who, in whom they put their trust was tortured, denied, and buried. There was no unique follow-through. In fact, after he died, it seemed rather unremarkable. As then, as they're telling this story about how unremarkable this man's death was, that they say, or they hear from Jesus. This is my paraphrase. Again, you fools, you should know better. Look at the scriptures, remember what you've seen, heard, and experienced as followers. You know what I believe? I believe that we stand in the place of those followers most times. Our lives can look like huge disappointments. Maybe we put our eggs all in one basket. Or maybe we live with some regrets or disappointments. Our hopes and our dreams fizzled out. It is easy to look at our lives. And assume that the same is true of our faith. That if we have invested in our life and disappointment has arisen, then why not our life of faith? Can you really trust that? It is the question for us as followers of Jesus Christ. There's nothing worth dreaming about because death is so final and if that's true, why bother with anything at all? Do not believe in anything unless it can be seen is the familiar adage. And yet, there seems to be something here for all of us as the story continues. As the disciples reach their destination at Emmaus, they are aware that it's getting late. And they want to protect this stranger. So they say, come on in. Come on in. It's radical hospitality. And I just have this vision of a smile sprawling across Jesus' face and thinking, hey, you guys got it right. You invite the stranger in. You invite the resident alien to come and to experience goodness and life. Good job, fellas. And then, when all sat at the table to eat, Jesus gives the words, like the words of institution, and he breaks the bread. And they see him for the first time. 
Imagine this as followers of Jesus, that every time we sit down, every time we have a potluck, every time we gather together to eat, we see the face of Jesus Christ, even momentarily. That vision, that assurance that Jesus was present in the moment of the breaking of bread is a confirmation to the disciples. Yay, they say. They also say, I knew, I felt something when we were walking here. I knew something was weird about it. And it made me think of those moments which are coming, becoming more frequent. Those moments when I say, ah, what was that? What was Emily? What was I about to say? Oh yeah, I uh, what's the name of that that band or that that person? I it's right on the tip of my tongue. You know those moments? Those are moments that are akin to those spiritual moments. I think they're very similar. There's something burning inside of each of us. There's something tingling on the journey of disappointment that says there's something else going on. It almost feels like a call. Something is near us. I can't quite put my finger on it, but this someone, I don't know what he's up to. Let's invite him in. It tells us a story of openness, of radical hospitality. It is an invitation to see, to have a conversation with the Christ who works on the margin. The Christ who works on the margins works in uncomfortable places for many of us. What are those places? I think that you are a congregation that extends that same radical hospitality that feels that itch to do what Jesus has done. And what I hear from you, which confirms that idea, is that yes, gay and lesbian people are welcome. Come, taste, see that the Lord is good. I hear from you. We don't care about your race or your ethnic background. We don't care that you say the right things doctrinally. It doesn't matter that you've been a Baptist. It doesn't matter if you've been a Catholic. I don't think using this text as our understanding of mission does anything less than tell us how to practice radical hospitality. It calls us into welcoming all. Because I also believe in my reading of scripture, that God is not going to judge us by who we excluded. Did you make sure that you excluded your neighbor Jim? He keeps cutting part of your lawn. He doesn't deserve to be in the kingdom. Oh, and who do you love? I'm going to check that off. 
and keep them out. That's not radical. That's a country club. What is radical? Is inviting all into the kingdom of heaven to experience it. To come into this place which is like a gracious bird bath and potentially making it a home. This is the mission that we are called to be a part of, which I hear itching in each of our hearts and our souls, an understanding of what is good and gracious and wonderful about our God through Jesus Christ, revealed to disciples before his death and after. In that mystery, we will celebrate communion, to be united with Christ, and to be nourished. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Friends, having heard the word of God read and proclaimed, I invite you to stand as you are able, embody your spirit, and to affirm what it is that we believe using the words of First Peter chapter one verses thirteen through twenty-five. Dear Christian, what do you believe? We place our hope completely on the grace that will be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed. We live knowing we were not liberated by perishable things like silver or gold. Instead, we were liberated by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a flawless, spotless lamb. Christ was chosen before the creation of the world and has ushered in God's kingdom. This was done for us, who through Christ are faithful to God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So now our faith and hope rest in God. This is the word that was proclaimed to us as good news. Amen.
may be seated. And we come to a time where we have a moment to consider how we are going to dedicate our lives to the purposes of God, the fullness of life that comes through the church, which is God's kingdom, and where purposes divine are worked out. So let us consider how we will devote our time, our talents, which are meant to be shared, and even our money. Let us continue in our worship as we give as God calls us. Once again, we enter sacred imagination. This time, instead of inviting you to close your eyes, I'll ask you to keep them open and gaze instead on the painting on your bulletin this morning. Often it is the marginalized that are the first to tell the good news. Often it is the marginalized who are the first to recognize who's in front of them. This is a painting by 17th century artist Diego Velazquez. It is called The Servant Girl at Emmaus. Gaze at this painting. See everything that's there. Recognize that this marginalized girl is in the kitchen. In the upper left corner, you can see through the window who's awaiting her service. She listens, listens, holding her breath. Surely that voice is his. The one who had looked at her once across the crowd as no one had ever looked. Had seen her. Had spoken as if to her. Surely those hands were his taking the platter of bread from hers just now. Hands he had laid on the dying and made them well. Surely that face the man they crucified for sedition and blasphemy, the man whose body disappeared from the tomb, the man, it was rumored now, some women had seen this morning alive. Those who had brought this stranger home to their table don't recognize yet with whom they sit. But she, in the kitchen, absently touching the wine jug she's to take in, a young black servant, intently listening, swings round and sees the light around him, and she is sure. We come now to the table, the table exactly like the table at Emmaus where Jesus talks to people who are blind but gives sight. As we gather at this table, we come seeking vision and conversation to respond to the call of Jesus Christ because we could tell that our hearts told us that change was a common. This is not my table. It's not your table. It's not even a Presbyterian table. It is the table of our Lord and our Savior, 
Jesus Christ invites all to come taste and see that I am good. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. Our hearts are glad, our tongues rejoice, and we live now in hope. For you have made known to us the way of life in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. on the road to Emmaus, and their hearts burned within them when he spoke of your word. Even now he is known to us in the breaking of the bread, remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ. We take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving we offer our very selves to you, to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and with your church in all the world. Like the first believers, fill us with the awe and wonder of your presence as we devote ourselves to your teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer, sharing what we have, and giving to those who are in need, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. <laughs> Christ took bread after giving thanks to God. He broke it, saying to those gathered around him, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. <laughs> Each time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our Lord until he comes again in glory. And come, he shall. I invite the elders to come forward to serve our musician and then to share with you. We'll do it with the last few coming down first and each row in front coming down after.
you to join me in the prayer of dedication. We have journeyed to this table and recognize you in the breaking of the bread. Having blessed us with the bounty of creation, you have claimed our lives for the mission you have set before us. At communion, you have shared with us your abundant grace. Help us become what we have received. changes our lives in radical ways. It begins on the margins with a savior in a manger. It begins with a savior who dies on the margins, crucified on a cross. It begins with disciples on the road like you and me who have an itch, an inclination for something to change. Because our hearts were always saying, like the disciples, that change was coming. Now, as we go forth, be good, be gracious, be loving, as God is. With the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.